we're going to be picking back up with communion. Does anybody remember what I said that people call them? They call them one or another thing. They call them two different things. Sacraments or what? Ordinances. Very good. They're either called sacraments or ordinances. And we use that term. People use that term. But they often use them in the wrong way. Does anybody remember what I mean if I use the word sacrament? What does the word sacrament imply? When we use the term sacraments, what is implied when I use the word sacrament? Anybody remember? Because we hear that in something. How many people have ever heard the word sacrament? So we do the sacrament of communion. The misunderstanding, and that's why I'm repeating it because it's actually pretty important. There is, when people say the sacrament of communion or the sacrament of baptism, when they use those terms, they're typically using them outside of what Scripture actually says they mean. Sacrament means that when you participate in this, sacrament of baptism, sacrament of communion, that it is sacred, that it sets you apart, that it has a saving power. So that when you take communion, it has a saving power. When you get baptized, it has a saving power. That's when they say sacrament of communion and baptism. Do we, as we're studying, when we talk about this, do we believe that communion and baptism are sacraments? I got a couple heads shaking no. That is the correct answer. No. It is not a sacrament. It's a term that we have brought in that actually other churches do use. There are churches that believe that when you take communion, that when you get baptized, you are now saved and you are in God's family, you are going to go to heaven. That is not at all what Scripture teaches us. So when you hear the terms sacrament, it's incorrect. So when you hear that, it's incorrect. What we're talking about are ordinances. Ordinances are something that God has ordained for us to do. That when we become Christians, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we can now show that we have become Christian by being baptized. If we are a Christian, we are told to be baptized, to show that we are Christian. So that is, that, that is an ordinance. The other thing is, is for communion, we call it an ordinance because Jesus himself said, do this in what? Does anybody remember? In remembrance of me. Jesus told us that we need to do this. So that is what God has said, you know, churches are going to do communion. You know, there are people that have, they can actually, and we'll get into this in a little bit, that actually can hold communion. There's nothing wrong with holding the communion service in your own home or you know if you're with somebody else you know some people I know some people where like if the church goes on a camping trip and they're at you know at a campground that they could hold communion there there are people that have hold, held it in their homes on different occasions so it's not the place that makes it you know it's not it's, it's like getting baptized in a church it's not that is not a prerequisite that is not an ordinance that is not said ever in scripture that you have to be baptized in a church you don't have to be having communion in a church what it is is the representation so we're going to go right now what we're going to do is we're going to step into the topic of communion communion we also i don't know if anybody has ever heard this they also refer to it as the communion of the saints you can have communion communion amongst yourselves that has nothing to do with Christianity. Basically, when we're talking about communion in the general term, communion in the general term means to have commune. People live in communes. They mean they're doing things together. When you have communication, you are doing things together. You're talking together. It has nothing to do with Christianity. So the word communion has a broad sense. You could have communion at your table when you're having dinner. It's basically having that conversation with somebody else or hanging out with somebody else. You have something. Here's another word that we use, having something in common with one another. So you see the word common, communication, you know, all commune, all these things mean that you're doing things together with somebody. When we're referring to it as when people say the communion of the saints, we're referring to the communion practice of what 
Jesus is going to be describing and what we're going to be teaching. Unlike baptism, unlike baptism, which is a one-time event, meaning we're going to show we're going to be baptized, you know, and this is what we're going to show that we accepted Christ. Communion is a practice that is meant to be observed over and over throughout the life of a Christian. It is a holy time of worship when we corporately come together. That sounds like the word communion. That's a good definition. Corporately coming together uh, as one body to remember and celebrate what Christ did for us. But like baptism, communion is rich in symbolism. To see why, when, and what, and how it is used means a lot more than just getting dunked in water or snacking on crackers and grape juice. Every element of baptism and communion have an illustration, symbolism, and a deeper meaning in and for our walk of faith. When we get baptized, it's just not somebody getting dunked in water. And you're like, why did he get dunked in water? Oh, because that's baptism. What's baptism? Oh, getting dunked in water. Now there's more to it. Same thing for communion. I remember when I was a little kid, I was a little kid younger than you guys. I was in church, and the church was having communion. And I'm sitting there, like, I just wanted it to be done. And so my mom leans over to me, and she says, what's wrong? And I said, this is so boring. That's not good for a little kid to say a communion because next thing you know, my father's grabbing me out of the pew, running me down the aisle, and then yelling me at me in the back of the church going, communion! Do, do, do. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So you guys met my father last week, but that was when he was much younger, when he was my age. To me, not understanding communion, communion seems boring. Like, why do we have it? What? I mean... Let's just be honest with you. Wouldn't you rather go to a church service that gave you a steak sandwich and a soda instead of a little tiny cracker and a tiny glass of grape juice? I mean, really, I'd rather have a whole cracker and a whole, you know, thing, a, a cup of grape juice. And it's like, that's not what it's about. It's the symbolism that we're trying to portray. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. In historical times, Luke 22, verses 7 through 20. This is during Passover. Passover was a religious feast that the Israelites held. It is not something that all the nation and everybody held. It was just meant for the Jewish people. Passover. And then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where is the guest house where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a larger upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found the things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. During Jesus' time, they celebrated the Passover. Jesus is saying, this is where we're going to celebrate it. I got it set up. There's a guy who's already got a place for us to go. It's all cool. Now I'm going to send you there. Does anybody know what Passover was? What is the celebration of Passover? It was the day where the angel of death came through Israel. This is back in whose time? Anybody remember? Moses' Moses's time. Moses' time. Children of Israel are in where? Egypt. Where are they at? They're in Egypt. God wants them to get out of Egypt. There's been a bunch of plagues that are going on. And the last plague that they had was the angel of death. And what that meant was the angel of death was going to be sent down and kill the firstborn son of every household unless they wound up taking blood and putting it on the doorposts. So what would happen is the angel of death would come through, and if your house did not have the doorposts marked with blood, your firstborn son would be killed. If you were uh, of the Jewish faith, if you were in the tribe of Israel, 
most likely because you were following God, you paid attention to what God said for you to do, and you would have your doorposts covered, and you would have the blood on there, and the angel would pass by. If you were Egyptian, and you were pretty much thumbing your nose at God and saying, God's a goofball, even after all these other plagues, you're still shaking your fist at God, there is no God, or the God of Israel stinks, or whatever, you'd go, I defy you, I'm not going to put blood on my doorpost, it's a bunch of malarkey, what's going to happen? And then the angel of death would come into your home and kill your first, firstborn son. Yeah, and so, so what would wind up happening is that happened, children of Israel left Egypt, and they celebrated that Passover. Obviously, the term Passover comes from the angel Passover. passing over. Very good. Okay. Very good. You know, at least they kept the name of the uh, celebration simple. And so they're celebrating this. And Jesus is telling his disciples, we're going to celebrate it as well. So it's all set up for that. We're continuing here. Luke 22, 7 through 20. We have, uh, we're picking up now with the Last Supper. We are talking about celebrating Passover and how now it's going to blend with the Last Supper. The Last Supper, here we go. Verse 14, we pick up. And when the hour came and Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table, because that's how they sat. That's how they sat. Basically, they'd sit on the floor around a table and, you know, they'd say like the, it wasn't like a bunch of chairs, you know, nothing real formal. They would just sit at the table and just eat there off the table back then. So they reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. OK, at this point, we don't really know what's going on. The disciples are like, huh, before you suffer? You're going to get acid indigestion from the meal we're about to eat? Who knows? How am I going to suffer? What's the suffering about? For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. Take this and share it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, which was wine, grape juice, okay? Uh, until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, he gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which he poured out for you. Here Jesus is describing what is going to happen to him. Those of us who've taken communion and understand communion, we get it. We see what Jesus is starting to symbolize. But because this is a basics class, we're stepping through this whole thing together. We're seeing that Jesus is saying we're celebrating Passover. And Passover was where God spared death from the firstborn son. When we look at what Christ is talking about, he's talking about his death. His death spared the lives of all of us that trust in him. His life was going to be the sacrifice. His blood was the door that's going to be on our doorposts. His blood. And he's sharing it with a bunch of people that are sitting at a table and have no clue what he's saying. And he's saying, this is going to be my blood. So when you think about the Passover and the blood of the lamb that was put on the doorpost, we're changing that up. Things are changing. Things are about to change now because that very blood that you're trying to remember that happened back then is going to happen shortly and it's going to be my blood now that takes the place of that lamb's blood because that lamb's blood couldn't really cover for sin. My blood is going to cover for sin. So when you take the wine that symbolizes blood, it's going to be my blood that you're, what, that you're thinking of. When you're talking about the bread that we're, broken, that we're breaking, we're not thinking about the lamb that had to die because of the firstborn son. We're now replacing that lamb with God's lamb, Jesus, the lamb of God, who now will be broken for our sin. His blood body will be the sacrifice it'll be his blood so now jesus is saying you understand the picture of passover now understand the picture that you're about to see and i am sure now since jesus hadn't died at this point that it became really clear to them knowing passover having grown up every single year celebrating that and then to see what jesus did and go, oh, wow, 
I understand all these years have culminated into this one time. And now Jesus has taken the place of that lamb. And this is the new symbolism. This is the new thing that we're going to be seeing. This is what the blood means. This is what the bread means. This is what it means now. Things have changed. The game has changed. In contemporary times, meaning more recent now, you know, this is what we do ourselves. In contemporary times, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. That's a big chunk of scripture we're going to be going through. So pay attention. It's going to be a lot of familiar scripture. Some of this, if you've ever sat in a communion service, you've heard these things said. Again, but because it's a basics class, I want you to kind of revisit why we have it and understand why we do the things that we do. You go, oh, I get it. I've done it. I've taken communion. I get it. I don't need to be taught this. If you don't think you need to be taught it, at least revisit it and appreciate what Jesus has done. We talked weeks ago about salvation. We've talked about the church service. So we're talking about things that are, are starting to grow together, starting to get together. And as we go in further weeks, everything will start to fall into place that they all work together. Okay? You can't understand baptism or communion until you, under, until you understood salvation. And because we're taking scripture, that is why the very first thing I talk about was understanding your Bible. Understand your Bible so that we know that we can get the truth out of it. Now know about salvation. Now these are the symbols of our salvation. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, now we're talking about what I just read about. Remember when Jesus had his disciples up in the upper room, we're revisiting this. It's like sort of like, oh, I remember when this happened. This is what Jesus said to us. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's quoting Jesus at this point. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, I want to revisit before I go further on where it says new covenant. You're like, oh, what is the new covenant? That also means that if there was a new covenant, there also meant that there was a what? An old covenant. The old covenant was what Jesus had arranged with the Jewish people that they would be doing. What would they have to do to temporarily Sacrifice. cover for their sins? Sacrifices. Very good. They would have sacrifices that would cover for their sins. And now that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that was crucified once and for all, covering for our sins, there is a new covenant that is given. We're going from the basically a covenant of mercy where God is sparing people to a covenant of grace where Jesus is now given the gift of himself for our salvation. For whatever for whenever for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As often as we have communion, it's going to let people know that we're celebrating Jesus and what he's done for us. Therefore, whoever eats and drinks, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, we're going to come back to this, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This goes hand in hand with what we're talking about, sacraments and ordinances. Here we're hearing that we are supposed to have communion in remembrance of Christ. We're being told to do this. So yes, it is an ordinance. However, when we look at this, if you're not a Christian and you participate in taking communion, it has no saving power whether you think it does or not. And that's what it's saying here. It's like, if you're not recognizing the body of the Lord, it's nothing. It means nothing to you. This is his way of saying it's not a sacrament. 
It is not a sacrament. You're doing things that cause you no salvation. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, and you take communion, are you now a Christian? Answer me is what? No. 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 Okay. If you are not a Christian, based on what we learned in the salvation message, if you are not a Christian and you die, you go to Hell. hell. Very good. That's not very good. It's not good that you'd go to hell, but that is a good answer. It's a correct answer. So what we're seeing here is this. If you eat and drink and this and that, and you're not doing it because you are a Christian unto the Lord, you are still damned to hell. That is what this is saying. Now, there's another thing, too, that we see just prior to this is where it's saying if you're taking it without your sins being straight and, and clear. And say, when we look at this, let's go back here. Whoever eats and drinks, uh, eats the bread, drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. You can take communion just for the sake of taking communion. There are plenty of times when I was a kid, well, I just did it because you did it. You know, you ever have that plate come by? And it's just because it's there you're taking it? All right, I'll take it. Has anybody in, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to sometimes still get guilty of this. When the cracker plate is going by, have you ever gone for the biggest cracker on the plate? You know, because you're like, oh, this would be the nicer meal. I'd like that. I'd like to have a bigger cracker. You know, then you get like you, the guy before you takes the real big one that's like, you know, like this huge thing. And you get this little tiny crumb. And you're like, ah, disappointed. So that has, <laughs> that has nothing to do with symbolism. You know, that has more to do with selfishness. But when you're concentrating on taking communion just because it's passing by you, just because it's the thing to do, just because you, you, know, you have people on both sides of you that are doing it, if it's not coming from your heart and your heart is not right with God and you're not taking it for the right reasons, then you are basically wasting your time and taking it wrong. So every time you take communion, I want you to be aware of this, that when you're taking it, you're doing something really critically important in understanding what Christ has done. It's just not the meal that's passing by. It's not a cracker and a little bit of juice. That's where the disappointment comes in. Oh, it's cracker and juice. Duh, I wish there was more. That's foolishness. Understanding what Christ did all of a sudden takes on a different meaning. Wow. His body was broken for me. His blood was spilt for me. That's what these mean. It should mean a lot to us then. It should mean more than just get this service over with. And you also want to go in with a, a clean heart. When we're looking at verse 28, it says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats and drinks the cup. When you go to, into communion, when it comes to that time and you're passing the, the bread and the drink is coming past, they'll say, take a moment to examine yourself. Now, how many people do that? Some people, uh, again, when I was a little kid, that was a good time to take a little bit of a nap. You know, it's like, okay, between me, you know, it wasn't a very big cracker, but I sure need to get a little rest in between before that little tiny glass of grape juice. And so you were just like, okay, I'm going to take a little bit of, the, and it, but what the pastor or whoever's giving communion is saying, examine yourself. Take a moment before you do this, before you remember what Jesus did for you, remember what you did before Jesus. That's a tough one because it's easy to remember, thank you, Jesus, for doing that. I appreciate it. But when you take it and go, wow, let me reflect on my own life. Man, I really screwed up. Jesus really forgave a lot. When we reflect on our own life, we have, that's what we're saying, examine ourselves. Now, the problem is this. When you're holding that stuff or you're about to have communion, and all of a sudden when you're told, examine yourself, and you're looking at your life and you're going, I'm still screwed up. I'm still a mess up. I, I shouldn't even take, I shouldn't take communion because my heart's not right. Now, I could ask a question 
of how many people, let me just, we'll do some general question here. How many people have ever taken communion before? So people have all taken communion before. So we're good here. Okay, so we all know what communion is. We've all taken communion before. Now the question is this. Has anybody taken it just out of routine? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of the same hands, you know. It's just routine. Have you ever felt, maybe you shouldn't raise your hands for this one. Have you ever felt when you've examined yourself, I shouldn't take communion this time. I shouldn't take communion. Because there's times when you shouldn't take communion. And you know what? It doesn't matter who's sitting next to you. If God's saying, you know what? Your life is kind of messed up and you need to get some things straight. So, so don't take communion this time until you really have those sins taken care of. That's what we're talking about examining yourself. There's some churches that will say, you know what we're going to do between now and taking communion is when it says to examine yourself, if you have an issue between somebody, you need to go deal with it. Have anybody ever heard of something like that? If you have an issue with somebody, you need to go deal with that. That's tough because that means, hey, wait a second. I got an issue. You know, I got an issue with somebody. That means I got to get up and maybe go over and talk to them. Now, I'm up front here, and I'm the speaker, and you're like thinking, okay, you know, maybe this guy's got it all together, and we're taking communion, and all of a sudden, I know that between me and Travis, we have an issue between us. Yeah, yeah, I just pick on you completely, uh, because you're the, you know, you know. No, you're the right person to pick on. No, but if I have an issue with Travis, and the Holy Spirit's convicting me of this I shouldn't take communion until I talk to Travis. I don't have a release from God from this until I talk to Travis. Now, if Travis isn't around, we could ask God, forgive me, I will need to talk to Travis, and you commit to God to talk with him if he's not around. However, if he's here and all of a sudden you're like, I need to get up and talk to him, you know what, it's awfully humbling to get up and go across the room to deal with something. But that's what God's telling us to do. God's telling us to deal with things that are very uncomfortable. How many times when we hear the word, if I was to say, guys, in this room, reflect on your sins, you could say, here's the past sins that I've committed, but hey, guess what? There are people in this room that are dealing with sins currently, and that should make you feel uncomfortable. That should make you feel uncomfortable enough that says, I don't know if I should take this communion until I deal with this. Now, it might be a personal sin where you pray between you and God and you ask forgiveness and then you are released to have communion with God, to take communion. But there also might be a thing where you have to get up, go across the room and talk to somebody. Or it might mean before you take communion, hey, if Travis isn't around, I'm going to pull out my phone. Travis, I need to talk with you today. Please touch base. Let me know when it's a good time to talk. Hit send. Boom. Now I can at least make it. I made a commitment. That's what I'm talking about, examining ourselves. Continuing, verse 30. That is why many of you, uh-oh, that is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. It's not the same thing as what you do in church when you're bored, falling asleep. What they're referring to here is anybody know dropping dead yes that's the blunt way of putting that i have not just fallen asleep i have fallen drop down dead so there are some who are weak and sick and some who have died that is not saying that everybody who has been sick weak or drop dead has been that had that happen because of sin some people their bodies just give out some people just die but in certain cases, there are times where God says, your sin is so grievous to me that you're going, I'm going to have to take you down for this. I'm going to have to make you sick. How many people have ever been put through something in their life, a trial, an illness, a sickness, something going on that you go, what is God trying to show me? Has anybody ever had that kind of experience where you just go, I, I think I'm a fairly good person. So, God, why is this happening to me? Show me 
what's going on. And that's what we're seeing here. There are times when we are going through things and that God wants to reveal things to us. Unfortunately, there are some people get so bound up into sin that God says, you're done. My judgment comes on you and you are now going to die. That is not to say that God has not given mercy. That is not to say God hasn't given grace. Because he's given those things over time. A lot of people are weak and sick before they die. It's God's way of saying, I'm trying to deal with you. If you're not willing to deal with this, I'm taking you out. I've given you a chance. Give me a chance to repent, examine yourselves, and come back to me. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. That's simple. Okay? A lot of times we sit there and if we judge ourselves, what we're doing then, instead of taking scripture to judge us, instead of letting the Holy Spirit convict us, we sit there and go, I'm not such a bad guy after all. God, you'd have to understand why I do this sin. You understand it's just uh, it's a temptation and I just fall into it. So God, you understand. So it's really not so bad. Matter of fact, God, it's not really a sin. Have any of you ever taken something you knew was a sin and all of a sudden turn it into something that's not really a sin? It's not a bad thing. A lot of us have done that where we're going, we know that this is wrong. We know we shouldn't do this. It's not so bad. I'm only going to do it this once. I can't ask God forgiveness. And there's this trail, and all of a sudden you've taken something that was a sin that you knew was a sin, the Holy Spirit convicted you that it was a sin, and here you're doing it and going, it's not so bad. That's what's saying, like, if we were to judge ourselves, we wouldn't judge ourselves. We are the most lenient. Would you agree that you are the most lenient person on your problems? I would, I would say that I am. Like, yeah, I, you know. Trust me, I can justify a lot of things. I can reason out a lot of things. One of the things I like to say, and I've used this phrase before, is my self-reasoning is my self-treasoning. Because usually what that means is I will try and reason something out. And I will cause internal treasoning. I will screw myself up because I've tried to reason it out. Have you ever tripped yourself up by trying to make a good excuse for what you're doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody's like, yeah. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. We fall, when we judge ourselves, we tend to lean towards the world. When we lean towards what God says, we're going to lean towards Him. When we take Scripture, we lean towards God. When we have the Holy Spirit moving in us, we're leaning towards God. We're leaning towards God. We're not leaning towards the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, communion, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give you further directions. Okay, here's what was happening. Back in the day, they were having communion. It became no big deal. It was not something that, okay, routine. Communion became routine. And then what routine came became was, you want to come over to my house? We're going to have communion. And then you go, okay, I'll come over to your house and have communion. What are we having? Okay, well, the Johnsons are having bread and soda. I'm thinking about having steak sandwiches and um, iced tea. And the, uh, you know, the Jones is over here. They're going to have pizza. All of a sudden, it was like, wait, 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 wait. We're getting caught up in the stuff. Not in what symbolism. the symbolism. We're not getting, we're losing the symbolism. We are getting involved in the stuff. So all of a sudden, this household that is going, we're breaking the bread. We're having the, uh, you know, the drink, the wine, the grape juice. We are celebrating Jesus. They didn't, people didn't want to go to that house. They wanted to go where the meal was. They wanted to go where the fun was because that's where the fun was over there. You know, better food. And they lost the symbolism. And so what we're reading here is this. Listen, if you're hungry, eat at home. When you want to have communion, come here. We'll have communion. 
Nothing wrong with the pizza. Whatever you want to have at home. But not for communion. communion. Have communion the proper way. Why do we observe communion? We're starting to wrap up now. We observe communion because the Lord told us to. We are to obey His commands. When He had given thanks, He had broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We have the scripture. These are the scriptures that we covered. In observing communion, we are remembering that Christ and all that he has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. You'll see that communion is a lot like baptism. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When observing communion, we take time to examine ourselves. This is a review. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In observing communion, we are proclaiming his death until he comes. It is then a statement of faith. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When you're eating this, when you're talking about the bread and the wine, you're talking about Christ's crucifixion on the cross. When we observe communion, we show our participation in the body of Christ. His life becomes our life, and we become members with each other. Got it. Communion. We're together. But we're together because of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 16-17. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation of the blood of Christ? Aren't we thankful for what Christ has done? He shed his blood. And is not the bread that we break in participation in the uh, body of Christ? Because there is one loaf... We, who are many, are of one body. We partake of one loaf. We share it because we're communing with each other. We're one body. Open or closed communion. Some churches permit only their professing Christian members to partake. Some churches only permit those of the same denomination. Most are open and all are there that believe. Open and closed communion. Basically, some churches go, it's only for our church members. So you can't have communion. You're a Christian or not, you can't take communion. It's a closed communion. Is that good? I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand their premise. Their premise is this. We know that our church people are Christians. We know that so that we know that they're taking worthily. If you come in, we don't know your heart. We don't know if you're a Christian or not. We don't want you to take communion wrong. So that's why they'll do that. I get it. I don't agree with it. Some churches only permit those of the same denomination. Again, it goes along the same way. Okay, if you're a Presbyterian, you're at a Presbyterian church, it works. If you're a Baptist, you can't go to a Presbyterian church. It's a denominational thing. At that point, denominations were never mentioned in Scripture to determine whether you should take communion. Most are all, uh, open to all who are there that believe. As we saw in Scripture, Scripture's only uh, communion is only meant for those who are Christian. Because if you take it and you're not Christian, it doesn't keep you saved. You're still going to hell. Walking through communion, just like what we did with baptism, here's the simple stuff. The physical steps. A pastor will stand in front and explain a bit about communion. He'll read maybe some of the Scripture that we covered. Pastors will explain it's for Christians only. Some of the stuff we just taught. Ushers or or selected church staff will assist the pastor. A time of personal prayer, examination, reflection. Seeing that is where you examine yourself. Plate with crackers are distributed. There might be a prayer or a song. And then the bread is explained, eaten, plates with the juice. So it's all these practices that you have seen. This is is what we see physically taking place. Not symbolically in our heart. Our heart condition is completely different. Uh, there might be a song or a prayer. The wine is explained and, and then drank. Celebration song at the end. Here's a question. Is it a solemn reflection, a celebration, or both? What is it? What is communion? Solemn celebration, or solemn reflection, or a celebration? Anybody got an answer for me? Or both? It's both. It's both. We should reflect on what Christ has done. That's solemn. That's heart-wrenching. But when we think about what Christ has done, it's a celebration. So it can be both.